I invite you to stand if you are able for the reading of God's word. Today's scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. In the third month from the very day the Israelites left the land of Egypt, they came to the Sinai wilderness. They traveled from Rephidim, came to the Sinai wilderness, and camped to the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Moses went up to the mountain to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob, and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. This is the word of God. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. For those of you who are new, my name is Chris, and I serve as the lead pastor here. It is a joy to be with you this morning. And let me just add by way of welcome, uh, wherever you are in your faith journey, whether you're someone who is confident in your faith looking for a church home, or whether you're someone who has a lot of questions and maybe you're unsure of what you believe, or maybe you're here this morning and you wouldn't profess faith at all, know that you are welcome. No matter where you are, you are welcome. We want to extend hospitality to you wherever you are. We want to welcome you into the, the community of First City Church wherever you are. If you have questions, if you have things you'd like us to pray for, practical needs that we could meet, let us know. We would love to be able to serve you and get to know you. Uh, understand that as a church, like our hope is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're a church who genuinely believes that Jesus Christ is the resurrected and reigning king. And we want you to know his grace and be transformed by his power. And so... However we may be able to, to welcome you into this community, let us know. We'd be lo love to be able to do that. Well, please open your Bibles uh, to Exodus 19. Some of you may be asking, didn't we just do Exodus 19 like back in September? Yes, the answer is yes. Why are we back in Exodus 19? Well, over the past few weeks, uh, the Lord has been actually stirring some things in me, and this in some ways came out of, as Paul mentioned, being able to preach up in Sioux Falls a couple weeks and, and ministering to them in a particular way. The Lord kind of stirred some things in my heart. Where I wanna, before we continue any further in our, our look uh, at the Ten Commandments, I want us to actually go back and cover some ground where we've already been and, one, emphasize and re-emphasize a couple things that, that we've already talked about, but I also want to bring more emphasis to some things that we, we just sort of passed over rather quickly the last time we were in Exodus 19. So we're going to look at a familiar passage, a passage we've already looked at, but we're going to look at it from a little bit different angle in some ways. That's why we are back in Exodus 19. And the title of my message this morning is Origin Story. So in Exodus 19, one of the important pieces of context here is that the Lord has brought Israel to Mount Sinai for a very significant, important purpose, to, to constitute and commission them as his people, to enter into covenant relationship. He will be their God, and they will be his people. Now, if you're familiar with the narrative of Scripture, up till this point, so if you kind of look at the, the book of Genesis and really kind of up to this point in the book of Exodus, one of the things we, we have to recognize is that there hasn't been a distinct people of God per se. That God has largely dealt with individuals and families, but there hasn't been a marked sort of people of God yet. However, back in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, God pr had promised to Abraham that he's going to take Abraham's descendants and make them his people. This is what we read. This is God speaking to Abraham. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your future offspring throughout their generations. It is a permanent covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. So God promised, I am going to bring a people, these are going to be my people from the descend descendants of Abraham. And in Exodus, we see God keeping that promise. Exodus 19 is God fulfilling that promise. In Exodus, we see the people of God become the people of God. And so another way to put it is in Exodus, we see the origin story of God's people. Now, those of you that know me, you know that I am a ginormous superhero nerd. Like, don't let the cool clothes fool you. All of this, nerd. Just big nerd. 
I love comic books. I love most of the superhero movies and TV shows. Like, I, I love it all. I'm a big superhero nerd. And one of the best parts of superhero stories is the origin story, where you learn how someone who is normal and unknown becomes a superhero who gives their lives to, to fighting evil and saving the day. And in any origin story, you kind of have two components. One, the circumstances by which the, the person gains his or her powers or abilities or resources to become a superhero. And then the circumstances in which they actually find their mission, their call, their motivation to be a superhero and save the day. So, you know, Batman's crusade against crime because his parents were killed. Or uh, Spider-Man's uncle saying, with great power comes great responsibility. Or Superman's truth, justice in the American way. Superheroes sort of have this moment of motivation. So origin stories, they, they really speak to identity. Who someone is and why they do what they do. And our origin story, the people of God, is the same. In the origin story of the people of God, we see who we are and we see our special purpose, why we do what we do. And those of us today in the church, us following Christ today, is the fulfillment of God's purposes for his people from the origin, from the beginning. So listen, God's people, First City Church, our identity, our purpose, it has spanned the ages. It is timeless. It is deep and it is profound. And when we go back and look at our origin story, we see who we are and what our purpose is. And so in looking at Exodus 19, here's what we're going to see from our origin story is that God's grace creates a holy people on mission. We find that God's people are defined first by his grace, and that that grace has made us holy, and in that holiness we now go and live on mission. That's our origin story. That's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's begin by looking at God's grace in our origin story. And this is something that we considered several weeks ago when we first looked at this passage. The Lord brings Israel to Mount Sinai to, to enter into covenant relationship with them. And when he brings them to, to this sort of covenant ceremony, he begins by emphasizing his grace to them. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So the Lord is recounting what he has done. He powerfully rescued and redeemed Israel out of slavery. The Lord showed that the Egyptian gods were false and fake and powerless. The Lord showed that the, all of the might of Egypt's army, the most powerful army on the planet, was nothing in the face of his strength. And the Lord had carried Israel out of slavery, and he was carrying them in the wilderness. He was their provider and their protector and their sustainer, and now he has brought them to himself to be in his presence as his people. And why does God do all of that? Why does God act to rescue Israel? Was it because Israel had earned it? Was it because they had deserved it? No, in fact, Joshua, in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 14, we learn that while Israel was in Egypt, they actually were worshiping the gods of the Egyptians. Israel was not faithful while they were in slavery, and yet, and yet, while they were idolaters and sinners, God rescues them. Why? Why does God do this? Because God is a God who keeps his word. Because God had made a covenantal promise, a binding commitment to relationship all the way back in, in the book of Genesis. So if we rewind to the beginning of the book of Exodus, where we first see Israel suffering in slavery, they're groaning, they're crying out. Here's what we read in Exodus 2. God heard their groaning God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. God saw the Israelites, and God knew. So God hears Israel's groaning, and he remembers his covenant. Now, to be clear, this term, remembers his covenant, this doesn't mean that God forgot about Israel. It wasn't like, oh, 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 Israel, oh yeah, I forgot about you guys. I should go down there and help you. No, this term is an expression that means God was motivated by covenant. So those of you that are married, you think of, that there was a moment where you made a covenant with your spouse. And sometimes you will bring to remembrance that moment of covenant, that you are in covenant relationship. And what does that do? That will spur you to faithfulness, to love, to sacrifice. Sometimes when there is conflict, you have to remind yourself, no, I'm in covenant with this person, and that means something. Did you forget you were married? No. 
Not at all. But by remembering, you're motivated by covenants. God hears Israel's cry and he remembers his covenant, meaning he's motivated covenantally. He's going to do something based on that covenant. Israel had not earned anything here, but God is faithful. And out of his grace, out of his love, out of his mercy, he moves, he acts to rescue them. The origin story of the people of God is one of grace, one of God's faithfulness. And so the question is, do you see the origin, of story of, the origin story of God's people as one of grace? Or are you writing an origin story where you free yourself from your own efforts? You free yourself by your own discipline. Are you writing an origin story where you are a good enough person to warrant God's grace and his favor in your life? Here's the brutal reality we all have to come to grips with if that's where we are. We have to come to grips and be honest with the fact, how could any of us earn favor with God? How could any of us be good enough to earn favor with God? When you just look around, just be honest for five seconds, look around at the world and just see, none of us are good enough. Scripture makes very clear there is none righteous, there is none good. And perusing TV, perusing social media for five seconds will show you that. Moreover, look inside your own heart and be honest. Do you think there is enough goodness in yourself to warrant favor for God's kindness, God's grace, God's mercy to you? Do you think you have done enough? Friends, none of us have earned God's grace. None of us have performed enough, done enough. None of us are good enough to warrant favor and to be in relationship with God. Also, Israel was in a political slavery they had no hope to free themselves from. No hope whatsoever. And as much as Israel had no hope, we are infinitely more enslaved to a far greater enemy. We in and of ourselves are enslaved to our sin, to evil, to death. And we cannot free ourselves. How could we ever hope to free ourselves when we choose our slavery? We choose our sin. We tighten the chains ourselves our hearts are bent away from the Lord and bent to sin. And yes, sometimes we hate our chains, but you know why we hate our chains? Because they're just making a mess of things. They're making life inconvenient. They're bringing pain, but at the core, we still love our sin. We still choose self over God. In and of ourselves, we cannot rescue. We cannot set ourselves free. We cannot earn anything. In and of ourselves, we deserve judgment, not grace. But friends, this is why the gospel of Jesus Christ is such good news. God's promise to make for himself a people, God's power to rescue and redeem from slavery, find their ultimate fulfillment in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Christ, we see the origin story of grace find its most glorious, most beautiful fulfillments because in Christ, God is faithful, he's covenantally faithful to save and to rescue and redeem from sin, from evil, from death, and from judgment. While we were still sinners, let that sink in, before any of us had done anything, while we were still sinners, no righteousness, no earning, God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to die for our sin. And Jesus on the cross took the judgment of God that you and I deserve on himself as he is struck down and killed. But he doesn't stay dead on the third day, he rises again, victorious over every sin, every evil rule, over death, and he is now the resurrected and reigning king. And here is the hope of the gospel. For all who put their faith in Jesus, you are rescued and redeemed by God. All your guilt forgiven, all your sin and all your shame washed clean. You are set free. You are in covenantal relationship with God as a beloved son and daughter. Our greatest need Jesus has provided for, our greatest enemies Jesus has defeated. Salvation, freedom, covenantal relationship, all of that, that is not something we earn and perform to get. We receive that by grace. This is our origin story. Through and through, the grace of God that has been lavished on us, that's what makes us God's people, his grace. And that grace has a great purpose, to create a holy people. As the Lord goes on to tell Moses in verses 5 and 6, now if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenants, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my 
holy nation. And so in light of God's grace, in light of his grace to Israel, the Lord calls for a response. Keep my covenant. See, to be in covenantal relationship is no small thing. Covenant is an all-in, all-of-life commitment. And so what does it mean for Israel, what does it mean for the people of God, to keep God's covenant? Well, here's the simplest way to put it. It is responding to the grace of God in the obedience of faith. See, the Lord had acted, powerfully acted, to rescue and redeem Israel. He he had moved to bring them out of the bonds of slavery, and now it was for Israel to respond in faith, to respond to to that grace in faith, to trust and depend upon the Lord, to follow and be obedient to him, to worship him alone, to be shaped by his word. They were to respond to his grace And so listen, friends, this is so important for us to recognize. The grace of God is not sentimental good feels to get you to think that God's a nice guy. The grace of God is God powerfully rescuing and redeeming a people. And that grace is worthy of nothing less, demands nothing less than our faith. And if Israel had a reason to respond in faith to God's grace, we have all the more reason Listen, God spared no expense to save us. He gave his all. He gave nothing less than his only son. And Jesus came and he died on the cross and he was resurrected in victory over every sin, over every evil, over death. Jesus Christ transforms a sinful, enslaved people and makes them a free people. He forgives us and washes us clean. And guess what? One day Jesus is coming back and he's going to renew and restore all things. No more sin, no more suffering, no more death. Life to the fullest forever. That kind of grace, that kind of grace, that extent, worthy of nothing less, demands nothing less than our faith. And so listen, we don't earn covenant, but we respond to the grace of God by faith and obedience. It is a response to what God has done for us. And in responding to God's grace, There's great blessing. In verse 5, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Faith and obedience, they bring the blessing of the deepest intimacy with God to be treasured, to be cherished, to be God's special possession. God owns it all. But of everything that he owns, to be those he cherishes. That's the blessing of faith. That's the blessing of faith and obedience. But in keeping covenant, we're not only a treasured people, but what is, what is God, and all the things that he lists out, he, he builds to sort of a crescendo here, a holy people. The Lord calls Israel a holy nation. And so when we looked at this passage several weeks ago, one of the things we talked about was how we can typically think of holiness through the lens of moral purity. And that is certainly part of it, but the tip of the spear, the foremost meaning, the primary meaning of holiness is set-apartness, uniqueness, different, no longer living for a common purpose, but a special purpose. So the moral purity that is a part of holiness, that is an expression of that difference. That is an expression of that uniqueness. We live in moral purity. We live righteous, good lives because we have been set apart, because we are different, because we are special. Now, track with me here to kind of return to the the, the superhero analogy here. I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that you know, we're all a bunch of spiritual superheroes here. I'm not putting that burden on you. That would be, that'd feel a little weird. But listen, as a superhero has a special set-apart purpose because of the circumstances, the incredible circumstances that have happened in their lives, we as God's people, because of the incredible grace that we have experienced, we have now been set apart. We are different. We are unique. We are special. No longer a common purpose. The radical grace of God that we have experienced, those circumstances have set us apart, made us different, unique, special, no longer common. This is our origin story. As God rescued and redeemed sinful and enslaved Israel and set them apart as a holy people, all the more in Christ, God has rescued and redeemed us and made us a holy people, set us apart for a special purpose. So 
Once again, here's the question we have to wrestle with. Do you see yourself as set apart? Do you see yourself as different? And is that difference more than how you vote and educate your kids? If I can press here, those things are important, but let me press here. You, you know that, that puzzle game where you have like two pictures and you have to find the difference between them? And they're pretty much exactly the same picture except for a few little differences and they're really hard to spot and to find? Church, sadly, this is how we can live our Christian lives. For, for whatever reason, we have turned down the volume on how different we're supposed to be and how different we are. And so if someone were to look at our lives and someone who's not a Christian, they may have to look really, really hard to see any difference. And I don't know where this comes from. I mean, I can guess. Like, I, I can say from my own heart, and I can guess from just my experience, but I think largely, to some degree, I think this is because we don't want to be seen as legalistic. We don't want to be seen as like, you know, those angry fundamentalists who stand on street corners and scream at people. We don't want to be seen as spiritual snobs. But I think also... We can have a love affair with the world. We can be comfortable in the world. We like the things of the world. And so we dial down our difference. And so, yes, don't be a spiritual snob. Don't be an angry fundamentalist standing on street corners yelling at people. Don't be legalistic. But listen, never forget, in all of life, we are a holy, set-apart people of God. The grace of God has set us apart. We're different. And yes, we live out that difference. We live out that special purpose in our ordinary, average, everyday lives. But do not forget, you have been set apart. You are different, and those differences should be clear. What you give your life to, different. What we celebrate, different. What we worship, different. How we spend our time, different. How we spend our money and resources, different. How we love and treat people, different. How we resolve conflict, different. How we use our words, different. How we use our sexuality, different. How we live as singles, different. How we live in marriage as husband and wife, different. How we raise our disciple, our kids, different. And all of these things, we are different. And that difference should be like one of those giant, like, Arrows with just like flashing lights, just like, hey, right here, there is something right here you need to pay attention to. That's what our difference should be, be bold and clear. And not because we are superior, not because we are somehow better than everybody else, but because the grace of God has changed us. The grace of God has changed us. Because of the grace of God, we no longer live for a common purpose, but a kingdom person. Purpose. Because of the grace of God, we're no longer slaves to sin, we're slaves to righteousness. Because of the grace of God, we don't live by lies, we walk in the truth. Because of the grace of God, we don't live in self-created identities, we live in the identity we have in Christ. Because of the grace of God, we no longer live self-reliantly, but we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of the grace of God, we no longer give ourselves to the idols of wealth and success and comfort and status and pleasure and sex. No, now we live for what is true and good and beautiful. Because of the grace of God, we're no longer angsty, angry people full of animosity. We are people of humility, of grace, of love, of peace and forgiveness. All of that difference because of the grace of God. Listen, friends, when we turn down the dial on our holiness and our difference, we are minimizing the power of the grace of God in our lives. We are minimizing how God has changed us. Yes, yes, we still blow it. Yes, we are still going to mess up. Yes, we still have sin that we have to contend with. But listen, we are not who we used to be. We are not dead in our sin, living in rebellion. No, by the grace of God, we have been made alive. We have been forgiven. We have been washed clean. We've been set free. We've been given a holy purpose. So even when we blow it, even when we mess up, we're still trusting him. We're still depending upon him. We're confessing our sin and walking in repentance. And we're experiencing God's power to renew us and change us over and over again. We are not who we used to be. This is our origin story. God's grace has made us, has created a holy people. And that holy people lives on mission. That holy people lives on mission. The Lord tells Israel, 
you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Priests had a distinct privilege of entering into the presence of God. They got to be in the actual presence of God. They experienced God's presence personally and intimately. Their identities and lives were defined by service to God. But priests weren't just those who themselves entered the presence of God. They they also brought others into the presence of God. They mediated between God and the people. They brought God's word to the people. And so Israel, as God's treasured holy kingdom of priests, in their set-apartness, it meant, one, that they were going to enjoy special, intimate access to God's presence. It meant their lives were going to be defined in service to the Lord and to worship him as the one true God. But it doesn't stop there. It never intended to stop there. Their set-apartness also meant they would be mediators between God and the nations. God makes it very clear, you're going to be a light to the nations. You're going to shine the light of my glory and righteousness and show what it means to be my people so the nations would come and worship the Lord. Israel's holiness was missional. Their holiness was missional. In living out their holiness and being set apart. They were to draw the nations to the Lord so that those nations could experience God's grace, turn from their sin, be saved and transformed. And friends, what was true of Israel is true of us today. The origin story of God's people in Exodus 19 continues for the church today. Listen to the language of the Apostle Peter used to describe the church in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession— There is all the language from Exodus 19. Priesthood, holy nation, people for his own possession. But Peter doesn't stop there. He continues. So that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God's grace has made us all of those things. Why? So that we can proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Our holiness, our priesthood is missional. It's meant to go public. Our set-apartness is for the purpose of proclaiming God's incredible grace. The light of God, his glory, his truth, his grace, his, his righteousness, all that he is, that light, it is marvelous. It is marvelous. And as we live set apart lives, as we live holy lives, we shine that light. What we proclaim with our mouths and we live with our lives, we show that light to be marvelous. Our lives are meant to show this is the marvelous grace and light of God and the power that it has in people's lives. So as we live set apart lives, here's what we show. We show how God takes broken and wrecked and ruined sinners and by his grace rescues and redeems and transforms them. In our set-apartness, we show how God takes enemies and rebels who live under his judgment and turns them into sons and daughters who live under his smile. In our set-apartness, we show how God takes anxious, angsty, troubled people with with little, little to no hope who are trying to carve out a sense of meaning and purpose and identity, and he turns them into joy-filled, peace-filled, hope-filled love-filled people who've been transformed by grace, who now declare the excellencies of God, and who find rest in Christ. Like when we show our difference, we show the power of God. When we show our difference, we show what God does in people's lives. We show the glory and the power of the gospel. We show just how good of news that it is. But sadly, we in the church, we can, we can make these two things be competing priorities as if attention to holiness and attention to mission are like two different things. And things that, well, if you're going to give priority one, you don't give us primor- as much priority to the other. But here's the, the truth, friends. When we turn down the volume of one, on the one, we will always turn the volume down on the other. These two things are connected. And so you cannot turn the volume down on one without turning the volume down on the other. And so I say this with with all love and respect, but listen, if you pop open the hood of any church that says, hey, you know, we're we're more focused kind of on our our, our personal holiness and spiritual maturity and mission isn't quite as important to us, 
Like, pop open the hood of that church and look at the community, you're not going to find a lot of spiritual maturity. You, you may even find a lot of bickering and infighting and disunity. Why is that? Because you can't go against the nature of something and expect to produce it, at least not in a healthy way. So, so let's say I wanted to, to build and produce endurance to run a marathon. Now, this is the wildest illustration I've ever used because I would never run a marathon. <laughs> but, but let's just say I want to build endurance to run a marathon. And so I go, and every day I run 15 minutes. Not a bad thing to do. But let's say I also spend 12 to 14 hours laying on my couch. I eat McDonald's for every meal. And in between those meals, I eat a lot of gummy bears. Am I going to build endurance? No, why? Because I am acting against the nature of endurance. <laughs> my 15 minutes of running might do me a little bit of good, but in acting against the nature of endurance, I'm not going to produce healthy endurance. And so listen, church, when we act against the nature of holiness, which is missional, meaning we turn down the volume of mission in our holiness, we are not actually going to grow into mature believers. This is why if your if you're focus on your, your spiritual maturity and growth does not include a sense of mission, you will stall out. Guaranteed you will stall out. If you want to inject some rocket fuel into your growth, start evangelizing. See what happens. Friends, we cannot act against the nature of something and expect to produce it. Conversely, if you think of churches who are all about that mission, but they dial down the call to holiness, maybe because they don't want to offend anybody or scare anybody off, that church is ultimately going to stop reaching people. There might be a lot of talk about mission, there might be a lot of events around mission, there might be a lot of activity around mission, but a mission is eventually going to die out. Why? Because there's going to be no power and beauty of the gospel on display. There isn't going to be lives transformed and lives changed. No one's going to see how the gospel actually brings change. And then what's going to happen? There's going to be a lack of awe and wonder and worship at the glory of the gospel. And when awe and wonder and worship go down, mission dies. Also, listen, church. Our holiness on mission is meant to be a good in society. And when we, as the people of God, do not live holy lives on mission in our society, it is a detriment to society. One of the things the gospel does, one of the power of the gospel, is it renews things. It renews people, it renews communities, it renews society. And how does it do that? It's not by some disembodied force. It does that by renewing people. And as people live on mission and live out holy lives, they bring renewal to society. The gospel empowers us to bring renewal. And so when we are not living holy lives, it has an effect on society. Our holy lives are meant to affect goodness and righteousness and justice and beauty and mercy in our society. We are meant to push back sin and darkness and to combat where there is evil and injustice in our world that is wrecking and ruining people's lives. Our lives are to be salt, as Jesus said. Salt preserves and it flavors. And how does our, not, does not, does not our world need God's people to live holy lives? Is our world not crying out for the people of God to be holy and live out their special purpose? Churches, there was, if there was ever a time in our society for us to be the holy people of God so we can go into our world, shine the light of the gospel, and affect goodness in our world, it is now. Our world needs us to be holy people, needs us to be different. They need to see something different. They need to see a different community. They need to see a different power. Holiness and mission, they're not competitors. They go together like a hand in a glove, like peanut butter and chocolate, like Batman and Robin. <laughs> and so listen, First City Church, your holiness matters. Give yourself to being a holy follower of Jesus. But that holiness is not meant to be contained in the four walls of your home, in the walls of the church. It is meant to go public. Holiness is missional. This is our origin story. This is who God's called us to be. So how do we do this? How, how do we hold holiness and mission together appropriately? By going back to the beginning, 
by experiencing deeply God's grace and celebrating God's grace. When God's grace has our hearts, holiness and mission are held together. Because listen, when you are excited about something, you will be an evangelist. You will take it seriously. So when Mindy and I were on sabbatical, summer of 22, we spent two months in Florida. And because we were about an hour north of Orlando, and so since Orlando is Disney country, we visited the Disneyland parks or Disney World parks multiple times. Now, I know some of you think Disney is the evil empire, and you might not be wrong, but there's a sense of nostalgia we're holding out for what it used to be. And so we, we visited. We, we loved the Disney World parks. And so one of the rides that opened that summer was a ride based on the movie Guardians of the Galaxy. See, again, superhero nerd, like just total nerd. And so this ride, we had heard standing in line at another ride that this was the best ride that, at all the Disney parks. And so we decided to, to see if this was the case. And so we get on this ride, and I tell you what, it is definitely the best ride that has ever been invented. This is the greatest ride, the greatest, it's a roller coaster, but it is the greatest ride that you will ever experience. There, there's just so many elements about this ride that were incredible. It's one, they, they sort of immerse you in the movie experience, and so you're, they kind of bring you into this scenario like you're in the movie. And then the roller coaster, it's like the, the highest level of technology, so it's moving you forward, backward, side to side. The cars kind of turn like this, and the thing is smooth. It's like you're on air. You don't even really feel like you're in a car. And then on top of that, if you're familiar with the movies, the Guardian of the Galaxy movies, one of the best parts of the movies is the soundtrack. And so while you're on this roller coaster, they have like these great classic rock songs playing in the background. And so the whole thing just feels like someone is punching your joy buzzer. It's just like, joy, 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 joy. <laughs> and Mindy and I came out of that ride with just, I think the smile was on our face for like a week. We we're just like, that was so much fun. And so when we went back a few weeks later, we did it again. And then we were at Disney back in last November a year ago. We were like, we're doing that. We built our whole schedule around riding this ride. And so then when I came back from sabbatical, people were like, how was sabbatical? I was like, it was great. Let me tell you about this ride. <laughs> like I wanted everybody to know, not what the Lord did in my heart. I wanted them to know about Guardians of the Galaxy ride. I was evangelistic because it was such a great experience. It was such a fun thing. It brought so much joy and delight. I was excited. I was evangelistic. And church, when we experience the grace of God deeply and powerfully, we are going to take holiness seriously. We are going to celebrate how God has changed us and we're not who we've been. And we will take that seriously. And also, when we've experienced God's grace, we want other people to experience it. And so we will tell them, this is what Jesus does for wrecked and ruined sinners like you and me. He rescues and he redeems us. He transforms us. He gives us life. He gives us hope. And I want you to know that. I want you to hear about what he's done for me and know that he can do the same for you. The grace of God will keep us holy, both holiness and mission together. That's our origin story. God's grace creates a holy people on mission. And so First City Church, as we continue in our series in the Ten Commandments, let this be a moment where we drink deeply of the grace of God. We remind ourselves of God's grace in our lives and we celebrate that grace. And in doing that, we're spurred in our special purpose. Because what do we see in the Ten Commandments? In the Ten Commandments, we see a call to holiness. We see what holiness looks like. We see how we are to be different. We see the righteousness that we need and our world needs. And so in light of the grace of God, let us respond in faith and obedience and let our whole lives be lived holy, set apart, different lives. Let our whole lives reflect the righteousness that is found in the Ten Commandments. And then let us go and let us shine the light of the glory and grace of God in our world. Wherever there is darkness, wherever there is need that the gospel will be taken, we go with our words and with our lives. Let our set-apartness draw people to the grace and power of Christ. Let people see our lives and go, there's something different there. What's going on? And in that, we can celebrate and share, this is the grace of God. This is what the gospel does. God's grace creates a holy people on mission. This is who we are. This is our origin story. Let's pray.